matters. So what I, what I wanted to do this, this morning is before we actually get into the teaching, I wanted us to spend a little bit of time in, in prayer. Um, I have three requests that I want us to uh, pray for. Um, and um, we, I know we're on Zoom, but we're going to try to pray together. And, and then if one of you can volunteer to kind of close out each prayer segment. And so um, just 30 seconds or so of uh, group prayer, and then one of you can and can volunteer to close out each section. But um, I'll call them out. Um, I, I want us to I, I want us just to, to pray for our church family. This is a whole lot of stuff going on in, in our church family. There's a lot of health issues going on, personal issues, career issues, uh, relationship issues. Um, and so I wanted us to pray uh, collectively about just our church family um, and the stuff that's going on in our church family. Um, 30 seconds or so, and then I'll ask somebody to close that out. Um, and the second thing um, I'd like us to pray about is um, our, our hope and our prayer is that um, in, in September, um, we're going to um, kind of roll out in earnest. Um, you know, for those of you who've been with us, which is most of you since the, the beginning, uh, we kind of started out as kind of a Bible study. Uh, we don't really have a church home. And so a bunch of friends are kind of just getting together to study the word of God uh, together and, and, and the like. And so, um, you know, obviously we've been at this now since since October. And so come September, it's going to be uh, a year of just kind of doing this, this, this thing. Um, but God has placed it on all of our hearts that, um, you know, he would like us to be more uh, uh, intentional about what it is that we're doing together as, as a group uh, without um, neglecting why we came together in the first place. And so why, why did we come together in the first place is so that um, we could be a community of believers that have authentic relationships and that disciple one another, encourage one another in the Lord so that we could be on mission together. And, 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 and we're not walking away from, from that at all. Um, that's always going to be the primary tenet of what it is that, why it is that we gather to, together. Um, but I was sharing with people, I'm a very unstructured person um, and I need to honor those of us in our group that um, function with a little bit of structure. Um, and so um, we, want to, to, we want to do something that's honoring to, to everyone. And so um, come September, our hope and our prayer is that we, we have something in place um, that feels even more like home, right? Now it feels like we're a collection of like collective of, of homes, but we want something in place that feels even more like home. Um, I'm being vague because I don't know what it is. And I'm hoping that we can pray and God will tell us what, what, that, what that looks like. Uh, and so um, that would be the second thing that I'd like us to pray that you know, God speaks to us individually and collectively so that we can hear from God what this needs to look like going forward. And when I say hearing from God, I'm not saying I'm going to hear from God. I'm hoping that you're going to hear from God and then you're going to tell me what God is saying. Um, so um, let, let's pray about that. That would be um, the second thing. Um, and then, you know, the third thing is, um, you know, we just want to we just want to pray for the church in general, the church uh, Catholic, um, because um, I've had I've been having conversations with a lot of pastors that are just um, struggling with this post pandemic, what the church looks like in this post pandemic um, era. Um, and so there's a lot of discouragement. Um, there's a lot of disappointment. There's a lot of confusion. And so um, I believe God is still trying to do what he's always been doing. He's in the business of saving people, restoring people. Um, but he's not just doing it at the meeting house. He's doing it across this country and across the world. And so I would like us uh, to pray for the church um, in general. So those are the three things that I would like us to, if we can, spend a little bit of time um, I will I will call them out, but the first one is going to be we're going to pray for our church family specifically, uh, and the need, uh, the pain, the hurt, the suffering, and the joys that are going on in our church family. Um, the second thing is we're going to pray uh, specifically for um, what God would have us do 
after the summer going into uh, the future. Um, and the third thing is we're just going to pray for the church, uh, the church of God in, in general. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, after 30 seconds of collective prayer that um, just somebody just somebody go ahead and, and, and praise uh, for us. And if somebody doesn't step in, I know Cherish is just going to pray all three times. So we'll just take it from there. So, all right, let's pray. Let's pray for our family. Lord, we have so many needs <clears throat> that are present, both um, unspoken, Lord. I just feel in my spirit there are a lot of emotional <sighs> wounds, Lord God, and heart wounds and spiritual wounds that are represented in our community, Lord. And Lord, we just first want to lift those up. We ask that you would bring healing, Lord God, to, our, to the hearts and to the souls and to the spirits of each of those today, Lord God, that are represented, God, the, the deep aches and the deep traumas and the deep hurts and the wanderings. And Lord God, we just ask, Lord God, the places that have just been so wounded that just hide behind walls, Lord God, um, that are muscling through and making things happen, but yet are still so wounded. Lord God, we ask that you would just move in power. Lord God, move in gentleness, but move in power, Lord. Be tender and gentle with those wounds, Lord God. We ask that you would just intersect and intercept them, Lord God, and that you would just remove the sting, Lord God, and that you would allow, Lord God, the healing work that you desire and the timing that you desire to take place, Lord God. We do ask for the physical ailments, Lord God. We lift up, Lord, continually, Dr. Bolden, Lord God, we ask that you would continue to heal him and be with him and just minister to him, minister to his spirit and to his mind, Lord God. And Lord God, we pray, Lord God, for baby Thabo, Lord God, that you would just do the miraculous in her life, Lord, that there would be zero um, insufficiency in any place, in any way, in her body, in her heart, in her mind, in her brain. Lord God, that you would continue to grow her as if she was still within her mother's womb, Lord God. Lord, we pray for, Lord, the rest of Chilobi's family, his grandmother and his sister and Mutenta as well, Lord God, that you would bring healing to their bodies. Lord, there's so many needs that are represented here, but Lord God, we just lay them before you. Lord, let us have open hands with them to lay them before you and ask you to heal. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to ask us to unmute our, our mics if we can, um, so we just can pray collectively um, as a body. Uh, we're going to pray now for uh, the meeting house and what it's going to look like going forward. Um, I'm just asking that we pray that whatever it is, it looks like that it is honoring to the Lord, um, that it brings glory and honor to him, um, but it also is um, um, uplifting and edifying uh, and that there's discipleship and that there's even greater community and love uh, amongst us. So let's just, let's just pray for the meeting house. Father, we just pray. We cry out to you. you give us direction and wisdom to what your plans are for me. Oh, God, that we see your turn to let the state determine and understand. 
answers Lord Jesus may your kingdom come may your will be done your knowledge your wisdom your way God I pray you stretch your right and bless us God bless us in the way that you want you have planned us to go bless your name for you your mercies, God. We thank you. Keep us in your wings. We pray that you will, um, your peace will rule with us, God, in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, I just pray that um, as this group of believers continues to move forward and to listen um, for your leading um, and for the Spirit's guidance, that you would just Help us to lay down our own expectations of what um, church should be and what um, this gathering should be, that we would not um, build something of our own um, image and our own desire, but that we would um, we would be faithful to what you're calling us to, Lord. And I pray that you would release um, release us of any fears of the unknown. Um, God, you, you lead your people into the unknown all the time uh, because we're going towards a kingdom reality that we haven't seen yet. And so would you help us to lay down our fear of um, stepping into unknown places and unknown um, ways of doing things, God, and give us the courage to be faithful to what you are doing. Um, God, I pray that you would give um, uh, all of us wisdom and discernment um, to hear your voice and to follow um, in whatever way that looks. Uh, God, I pray that you would bring um, Bring the people to this that um, that you have for this particular gathering of people. God, I'm going to pray that the gifts um, that your spirit has poured out here, God, that we would not diminish those um, because we think that we need to build something that looks specific and we'd rather have that than the gifts that you've given. Um, and I just got to pray that we would put to work the things that you have gifted um, us to do, um, even if that doesn't look like what we think this should look like. Um, God, and I pray for fruit. I pray that um, as um, discipleship continues and as mission continues, God, that we would see um, not numbers, God, but we would see um, fruit. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would teach us to measure um, measure success, not by, um, not by numbers, whether that be dollars or um, numbers of people in the seats or on Zoom screens, Lord, but that we would measure success by whether or not um, your kingdom seems more present mm. than it did the day before. Mm. Uh, and thank you for going before us. Um, thank you for calling us into unknown things because you trust us with your kingdom and with your purposes. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the last thing I pray Amen. for is the church. God is on the move. Um, just uh, want to um, join and come alongside all the churches around the world that are calling on the name of the Lord so that he may be glorified. So let's just pray for the church together. And I guess as somebody puts it together. Let's pray together. Father, we just pray. Just pray. <laughs> <laughs> decisions based on fear. Lord, I just, um, I thank you that you are at work around the world, that it's not just in this small group that you are active, um, but that you are continually on the move um, in every corner of creation. 
um, and you have placed certain um, parts of our family in those corners to do specific works that might look different than what you've called us to. Um, but God, I pray for the church um, globally and um, particularly in America, God, that we would not be concerned with um, position and power, um, that we would not be afraid to lose um, what seems like losing ground um, when it comes to being obedient. God, I pray for pastors that feel caught between systems that have felt like they've been in place forever, um, that are working against um, your purposes, God, um, but feel like that's the way things have to be. Um, and between that place and the place of um, feeling called into something new and something that feels scary and like it might, um, it might cause them to lose position and power. Uh, God, I pray that you would give them courage to be faithful. I pray that you would comfort them um, and remind them that you go before them and you go with them and you go behind them. Um, and so Lord, I pray that you would make us a people that are um, far less worried about um, image and um, far more concerned about um, the reconciliation or restoration that you have called the church to live out um, in this world. Got to pray that we would give up um, trying to do your job and the Holy Spirit's job um, and that the church would step fully into her calling to be the church, to be gatherers of people, um, Lord, that, that you've said that you will sort out later. Um, so let us be um, in our churches. Let us be gatherers. Let us be fishers of men, um, not worried about what kind of people we're gathering, but just gathering in your name um, and then letting you do the rest of the work of um, sorting that out and sorting out our own intentions and desires. We love you. Thank you that um, you have chosen to work through humans. You have chosen to work through the church. Um, help us to step into that and to lay aside our own um, our own intentions um, and take on yours. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Um, we're going to get started this morning. Mark uh, chapter 11. Um, how many know that chorus? I love you, Lord. And I live my voice, you gotta get, help me sing it. To worship you. Why am I the only one singing? Oh my soul. And man, I, I hope it sounded better to the Lord than it sounded to me. It was um, great. Um, and uh, let me uh, let me open this up in the word. For some reason, my 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 camera is not working, but that's okay. I'll go. Uh, Mark chapter 11. Uh, let's open a word of prayer and then we're going to jump right into the text. Father, we just thank you. We're just so thankful for this time that we've had um, uh, in worship and in prayer. Um, yeah, what a sweet time, God. Um, I, I'm just thankful for every single person here this, this morning and um, the, the stories in their lives that have brought them to this place. Um, and that have brought them to us uh, so that we could be together to worship you this, this morning. So um, take something from each of us, God, and make it a sweet sacrifice um, to you that you might build us into be a, a people who bring glory and honor to your name and into a people who love each other and edify one another and strengthen one another uh, in you. We ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey, we're in Mark chapter 11. Uh, so uh, I had asked that, that we just read Mark chapter 10. Um, let's just jump into Mark chapter 11. And part of that is because obviously last week we were um, over at Houston Northwest, so we didn't get into Mark chapter 10. Um, but I kind of did want to be on, on, on schedule so that um, the last couple, uh, the last two weeks of uh, August um, and then the first week of September, we could 
take that time to really just pray uh, together and just kind of prepare uh, for what God has for us. And so I just wanted us to kind of be on, on task a little bit here. So, so we're in Mark chapter 11. Um, I did send out a message earlier uh, for us to read Mark chapter 11 because it's, it's a, it, it is a, a curious chapter um, in, in the Bible, like we said before, um, because it, it seems to show a Jesus who is almost as if he's out of character, right? Because he does a couple of things that aren't typically not Jesus see things to do. The, the first thing he, he does is, you know, he starts off by telling his disciples to essentially go take something. I mean, I would call it stealing, but you can't call it stealing because Jesus is the one who instructs them to do it. But he tells them to go take this, this donkey. Uh, and only if somebody asks them what they're doing, then they can say, you know, the master has sent me to, to do. Now, I wish I could do that at a Porsche dealership and just walk in into a Porsche dealership and get myself a Tarja 911 and drive away. And if somebody asks me, I can tell them the master told me to do it. But somehow, for some way, um, Jesus, yeah, thank you. Jesus, uh, the disciples get away with that. Um, and so they, they take this donkey. So that's one thing that's kind of odd about that. Um, the other thing is, uh, the next thing is Jesus, atypical of Jesus, he brings attention to himself, right? Because all throughout Mark, we've we've seen every time somebody wants to proclaim, you know, he's healed somebody. For the most part, he tells people don't don't say anything about it to, to anyone. But not only does he bring attention to himself, he brings attention to himself in a grand manner. He allows hundreds or thousands of people to be shouting Hosanna and, and kind of worshiping him as he rides on this borrowed donkey that he's riding into, into Jerusalem. Um, and then the next day, he does something even more odd. You know, he has this contact with this inanimate object in a fig tree uh, that doesn't speak or do anything, and he, he curses a fig tree, and then he goes from there uh, to a, a temple and starts acting in a way that seems kind of violent, seems atypical for the Prince of Peace to, to be acting that way. Now, if, if it's out of character for, for Jesus, I, I, I think he deserves a, a pass um, because this is a, this is a very stressful week for Jesus. This is the final week of Jesus's life. And we're going to be, um, going through Mark chapter 11, which is essentially Palm Sunday, but this is Passion Week for, for him. This is the beginning of the end for him as he is making now his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And it's all going to culminate on Resurrection Sunday, which is a week um, later. But I don't think it's out of character um, for Jesus. I think it's very much in line with character in, in Jesus's character. And we're going to see that through this, this text. And this text is going to uh, represent a very important pivotal point in time for Jesus. The last week of Jesus is so important to the gospel of Jesus um, and the ministry and the work of Jesus that the disciples recognize it because John dedicates the entire half, the second half of his gospel to these seven days. Mark will see will dedicate the last third of uh, his gospel to these uh, seven days. And so the writers of the gospels recognize um, that in these seven days, um, Jesus's energy, all of Jesus's energies, the energies of the kingdom of God are, are focused now on these seven days. And that will begin with now the king of the kingdom of God uh, coming into the city of God in, in David's city and will now proclaim the gospel uh, both in word and deed and in the final act on the cross for one last time. So, so let's read the first uh, 10 verses of Mark chapter 11. It says this, as they approached Jerusalem at Bethpage, which means the house of unripe vines or unripe olives and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said unto them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will enter it. You will find a colt tied there on which no one has ever sat untie it and bring it here. Don't tell anybody. And if anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Then you say, the Lord has need of it. And immediately he will send it back here. So they went and they found a colt tied out the door outside the street and they untied it. And some of the bystanders were saying to them, what are you doing 
untying the coat. Spoke to them just as Jesus had told them, and they gave them permission. They brought the coat to Jesus and put it, their cloaks or coats on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their coats on the road, and others spread leafy branches, which they had cut from the fields. Those who went in front and those who were followers were shouting, Hosanna, which means come, Lord, and save us. Come, Lord, come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. Now, I would have to admit to you uh, that before I really started looking into this um, this text, I had always connected Jesus coming into the temple to I'm sorry, Jesus coming into Jerusalem to Jesus' cru crucifixion and, and resurrection. Um, and it just kind of was a blur of uh, events. And if you don't really look at this text, nothing really out of the ordinary jumps out at you, but it is kind of weird what, what happens here, because I imagine what's going on. These, these people are all there together, and they, at the very least, they acknowledge or recognize that Jesus is a king and a savior. Because the Bible tells us that they're shouting, Hosanna, come, Lord, come and save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And, and seared in the conscience of any uh, Jewish person who read Jewish old Jewish text, the Old Testament, they would know that this Messiah that was promised to them would show up in this way on, on a donkey. If you read Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10, I'll read verse 9. It, 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 it tells us, or it, it, the, the prophet prophesies about how this Messiah would show up and says this in Zechariah 9, 9. It says, rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious. But how does he come? Lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on a fowl of a donkey. So the fact that the crowd is shouting, Hosanna, come and save us, means that at the very least they acknowledge that Jesus is this foretold king, this king that is coming, the savior that is coming. But the problem that they have is they're blinded as to which or what type of savior he is. Or maybe they're not blinded, but maybe they're just like you and I sometimes. They know who Jesus is, but that clashes who, who they want Jesus to be for them in their particular situation. Because they, they're very aware of what the prophets say, what the scripture says about Jesus. But that type of Jesus uh, is not relevant to their current circumstance, or that type of Jesus is not the type of Jesus that they want to see in their current circumstance, because their current circumstance, they're under bondage, they're under occupation. And so they like the king coming into the kingdom part, but they don't like the stature of the king who is lowly and riding on a donkey. They want Jesus to show up the way they want him to show up, and not the way that the scripture tells or that his revelation says or who he needs to be. Now, even if they ignored scripture, they should have recognized the culture context of that. Because when a king came into a kingdom, a victorious king coming into a kingdom didn't come in on a donkey. A victorious king that came in to conquer rode in on a horse with chariots, with the heads of slain enemies in tow, and not on a donkey. A donkey represented somebody who came in at the very least in peace. But more so, a donkey was really a symbolism of shame. Somebody who came in and surrendered. When kings of old came in on a donkey, they were either saying we're coming in peace or being brought in in a form of surrender. And they knew this, even if they ignored the prophecy, they knew the cultural relevance of what Jesus was saying was, was doing. And so they could have and should have recognized it, but they don't. Or they do, but they ignore it because, once again, Jesus doesn't show up the way that they want Jesus to show up. And that's why what happens next seems so anticlimactic because it's easy to, to miss verse 11. But, but here's the picture. Everybody is coming in or Jesus is coming in 
there's thousands of people around. There's people shouting and screaming Hosanna and worshiping and laying, the, laying, laying their coats down and laying leaves down. Um, and what does Jesus do? Now, now you would think with a procession like this, Jesus is going straight to the halls of power. He's going to the courthouses. He's going to the castles where the kings and the people that are in power and the power structures are. That's not where Jesus goes. The Bible tells us that instead of going to that place, Jesus goes to the temple. But when he gets to the temple, he doesn't do anything dramatic at the temple. The Bible tells us in verse 11 that Jesus entered Jerusalem and comes into the temple. And what does he do in the temple? He walks in, he looks around, and then he goes back outside of the city and goes to sleep. Like that is the most anticlimactic thing that can happen to a buildup that is so great. I mean, these people are expecting a king and a savior to come in with military power and to overthrow this kingdom. And all Jesus does is he goes to the temple. He doesn't do anything at the temple. He doesn't say anything at the temple. He just looks around at the temple and then he goes back and he goes to sleep for the night. I mean, that is Palm Sunday. Now, that's not how we celebrate Palm Sunday because we connect Palm Sunday to resurrect the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so in our minds, Palm Sunday is like a powerful event. And it is. The worship of Palm Sunday is powerful. But there's nothing that happens in terms of action on Palm Sunday. He simply walks into the temple and he goes back home and he goes to, or he goes back out of the city and he goes to bed. But something does happen in the spiritual, because remember, these are people who are looking forward to an earthly king and an earthly kingdom that is going to come to overcome uh, or to, to defeat their earthly oppressors who were represented in the courthouses and in the castles where the kings lived. But this was a heavenly king that was coming to usher in a heavenly kingdom. And so where he goes is not to the epicenter of political kingdom, but he goes to the epicenter of where their kingdom of worship was in the temple. That represented the epicenter of religious worship, religious life, and the religious kingdom in that day. And so Jesus takes his procession, rightly so, not to the representation of the earthly kingdom, but to the representation of the heavenly kingdom. But even when he gets there, he doesn't seem to do anything except on the next day. So verse 12, it says this, verse 12 to 26. And on the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Jesus becomes hungry. And seeing at a distance, so he's gone to sleep. Now he's coming back and he's going to head back into the temple. So when I was on the way into the temple, um, verse 13, seeing at a distance, a fig tree um, in a leaf. So a fig tree in leaf, sorry. He went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And he came to it and found nothing but leaves, for this was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. So if you want to underline that, underline his disciples were listening. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and he began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seat of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach them to say, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, underline all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. Verse 18, the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him for they are afraid of him for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they would go out of the city. So Jesus would leave. Verse 20. And this is why I asked you to underline his disciples were listening. In verse 20, it says, as they were passing by in the morning. So the next morning they passed by. They saw the fig tree from, withered from the roots up, underline roots up. Being reminded, right, because the disciples had heard, verse 21, being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea and does not in doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted to him. Therefore, I say to you, all things which you pray and ask, 
believe that you have received them and they will be granted to you. Whenever you stand praying, this is important, verse 25, whenever you stand praying, forgive if, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father who is in heaven will also forgive you of your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father who is in heaven forgive you for your transgressions. So the following day after Jesus has gone to sleep, this anticlimactic event happens and he, he goes back to uh, the temple in the morning. On his way to the, the temple, um, he comes across this, this fig tree. Now, remember, it's on his way into the temple and we've read what happens in the temple. Um, Jesus is going to go into the temple and he's going to um, uh, proclaim judgment on the temple in word and in deed, right? If you remember, this is not the first time that Jesus has done this. The first time that Jesus has done this uh, is in John chapter 2. And John chapter 2 tells us that this is at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Because remember, there's a story of Jesus uh, turning water into wine in, in Cana. And then John tells us, Shortly thereafter, immediately after that, Jesus goes to the temple and he does something that's similar to this. And now three years later, at the end of Jesus's ministry, now Jesus goes back to the temple again and he does something similar. But in between uh, him going to the temple, he comes across this fig tree. Now, I don't know a whole lot about fig trees. Um, I'm not a gardener. Um, or horticulturalists or anything like that. But I did do a little bit of studying and a little bit of research on, and, on fig trees. And this is what I found out because I found this very fascinating about fig trees. Um, fig trees have a, uh, a, a, a lifespan or a span from the moment you plant them to the moment that they produce fruit of somewhere between three and five years. Typically the first fruit you will see on a, on a fertile, and good fig tree is around three years. Second thing about fig trees is, is that they typically produce fruit in the fall, but a really good fig tree will produce fruit two times in the spring and in the fall. The third thing I found out about fig trees is um, a way that you know that a fig tree has figs is they produce these bright green leaves. So the, the, the buds of the fruit uh, show up first, and then these big offshoot of big green bright leaves will, will, will show up. And so, so anybody who's walking uh, down the road and is hungry for something to eat can look and see, oh man, there's some bright leaves on this fig tree. That means that there's fruit on this fig tree. And if it's a good fruit, a good fig tree, uh, it will have produced fruit around three years after it is planted. Jesus, from the first incident in the temple to the second incident in the temple, uh, a period of three years ha has, has passed. A and the three years Jesus has given the, the leadership, the religious elite, and the children of Israel an opportunity to respond to the seeds of salvation that he's planted. Uh, in their lives, in, in, in their ministries, and in, and, and, and in the nation. And, and now at the end of this three years, uh, Jesus has come back to the temple to look for fruit because he's planted these seeds and he's done his, his ministry. And now he's coming back to the epicenter of where it's supposed to be the life, the religious life in the city, a place that if there is going to be any fruit that is born uh, would happen in this temple. And what does Jesus find in this temple? He finds the appearance of holiness, the appearance of worship, the appearance of dedication, but not the fruit of it. And so Jesus is going to then both verbally and physically chastise the people in the temple. But Jesus is also a prophet. And Jesus understands the significance of a fig tree in the lives of the people in, in Israel. And he wants to make sure, because the Bible tells us, he does this in the hearing and the eyesight of his disciples. Because not only is Jesus wanting to show something when he gets to the temple, but he is a prophet that is trying to reveal something about the, the spiritual state of the nation of Israel. And he does this in the form of his interaction with the fig tree. Because for all intents and purposes, this fig tree is blooming bright green leaves. 
But when the master shows up and looks if the fig tree has produced any fruit, he has found that there is no fruit. In other words, this fig tree is simply being hypocritical as a fig tree. It's representing that it has fruit, but there is no fruit to show. And so Jesus now will verbally curse this fig tree, but he's going to go into the temple to look for fruit in the temple, and he's going to find the same thing in the temple. There's this appearance of godliness, this appearance of religious activity that's happening in the temple, but there is no real fruit. And that's why Jesus says in verse 17, he says, my house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations. In other words, this house that I'm in, this temple that I'm supposed to be in, this epicenter of religious life is supposed to be a house that produces fruit. It's supposed to be a house of prayer. It's supposed to be a house where the presence and the power of God is proclaimed and manifested, but it is not. It is, in fact, a den of thieves. And so what Jesus does verbally and symbolically to the fig tree, he does physically and verbally in the temple. He curses and he destroys the, the hypocritical activity that's happening in the temple. But he does that in the ear sight and the eyesight of his disciples. Why? Because his disciples, he wants, we, we, we talked about this, I think a couple weeks ago. Jesus had a twofold ministry, right? There was a ministry to the people who simply were around Jesus. Like when he fed the 5,000 and when he performed these miracles, there was a ministry to those people. But Jesus' primary ministry was to the 12 disciples that he needed the gospel to go forward through. And so Mark wants us to know that the real interaction that's happening right now is happening between Jesus and his disciples. And so that's why when he curses the fig tree, Mark wants us to know that his disciples witness this because Peter is going to ask a very important question in the following verses. Because if you remember, the, the, the fig tree to the nation of Israel represented two things. The, the first thing is from a practical level, it, it represented a, 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 a fruitful fig tree represented the blessings of, of God to the nation of Israel or to the farmer. That's what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 8. It says this, verse 7 and 9. It says, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks, of water, of fountains and springs, flowing forth in valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley. So God is bringing them into this land, and he's going to bless them. He's going to bless the fruit of their labor, and it's going to have wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees, of pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you eat food without scarcity. So, so, so basically, God is saying, look, you will know that you are being blessed by me when the fruit of your labor, the fruit of your land, including these fig trees, produce fruit. But you will also know that you are receiving a curse from me when the fruit of the, your labor, the fruit of the land, ceases to produce fruit. And that's why he says this in Jeremiah 8.13. He says, I will surely snatch away. So now this is God removing his favor from the children of Israel. I will surely snatch them away, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine, and there will be no figs on the fig tree. And the leaf will wither, and what I have given, and what I have given to them will pass away. But more importantly... Any religious Jewish person who studied Old Testament scripture knew that not only was a fig tree a representation of the blessing of God, but a fig tree was a representation of the spiritual state of the nation of Israel. That's why in Joel chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, the prophet says this, For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion and its fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine, Israel, a waste, and my fig tree, splinters. It has stripped them bare and has cast them away. The branches have become white. And so in cursing of the, the fig tree and the clearing of the temple, Jesus is making a prophetic statement about the judgment that is coming up, up, upon the nation of Israel. The, the climax of the 
event of Jesus coming into the kingdom um, happens in the interaction that Jesus, well, not the climax happens on the cross and the resurrection, but the going into the temple happens by way of the interaction that Jesus has with his fig tree in the hearing of his disciples. Jesus recognizes um, a problem with the spiritual elite and the spiritual leaders of that day that they, that they had a, a form of godliness, a form of righteousness, uh, but an absence of the power and absence of the fruit. Now, if we were to be honest, um, we know and we agree because we are part of a church. The church is made up of people who are sinners. And all hypocrites are, are sinners, uh, but not all sinners are hypocrites. And, and there's a distinction there because the problem with hypocrisy is it knows that there's something wrong, but it hides it. Not only does it hide it, it purports or it pretends that everything's right. And that's destructive because Christ can't do anything with the hypocrisy. Because if we go around, if I go around pretending that everything is right, um, I'm not only lying to other people, I am lying to myself. And if I'm lying to myself, I'm not willing to come to grips and to come to terms with my own sinfulness, my own shortcoming, and Christ can't do anything about that. And the result of that is going to be, I'm going to have a life and a lifestyle that purports to produce fruit and, and, and shows these shiny green leaves, but there's no power and there's no real fruit that is being produced in my life life. And that has been incredibly destructive. We had a conversation uh, with a bunch of friends yesterday about this. It is the, the church, um, for better or for worse, has, has kind of forced us into this almost lifestyle of hypocrisy where we can't be authentic with one another because we've treated the church as, as a, a hall of saints instead of a hospital of sinners. We've treated the church as a place that we come and show how righteous and how good we are. And so all of us go through um, um, acting class, which is called the church, throughout our, our lives. And we go around acting uh, like there's nothing wrong with us. We go around acting like we're not hurting, that we're not suffering, that we're not, not struggling. And because the person next to me is acting, I have to act that way. Because I'm not going to be the only person who's going to be honest and say things aren't going well in, in my life. But what happens to that is, the power of God is not present in our, our, our lives. And, and when the crucible of life happens and life happens, uh, we start wondering like, wow, I thought I had relationships with these people, but we realized that they weren't being truthful about who they were and we weren't being truthful about who we are. And Christ can't do anything with our hypocrisy. And what's going to happen if, if we perpetuate that over the long term? Um, our lives are going to be lives that are not fruitful. My hope and my, my prayer is that as a group, as a body of believers, um, that we could live life authentically with one another um, under the recognition that we truly are all sinful people saved by the grace of God. But God gives us the grace to not be hypocritical about it. Because then God cannot empower us to strengthen one another and to encourage one another and to disciple one another and to live graciously with, with one another. Because that's what Christ does with, with us. If we were to be honest in our private time of prayer and, and, and in our closets where we pray, the number one thing that we pray for is Christ's grace in our lives because we recognize how fallen of a people we are. And we don't like to share that with other people. And I don't blame you and I don't blame myself um, because um, that's how we've just been conditioned as a church, that this is a museum of saints who are holy. And so we walk in the church, we have to act holy, but it's not. It, it, we are a people that are saved by the grace of God and that we come into the presence of God uh, with one another to receive mercy and forgiveness and to be strengthened and to strengthen one another. Jesus wants his disciples to hear that because he wants them to recognize that in that, in the openness and the honesty and in the community, in community, 
comes through power because Peter asks this question. Look at what happens in verse um, 21. Peter recognizes it and he says to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig which you, you cursed has, has withered. Now, th th this, is a, this is an amazing statement in, in, in itself because um, if you know anything about ecology and plant life, um, something doesn't simply wither overnight. Something doesn't go from being 100% looking fruitful with bright green leaves to being fully withered in a period of 24 hours. And this is clearly a miracle that Jesus performs. And, and, and that's what astonishes Peter. And it's important that we recognize that that's what astonishes Peter because Jesus' response has been taken out of context. Because we've all seen the scripture, but what we've seen about this scripture has always been, hey, the, the Bible here, um, you know, when we struggled with this text, the Bible here says, hey, you ask God for anything. You ask God for anything. You even ask God to move a mountain. And if you have enough faith, then the mountain can be moved. But what that's created is it's created a psyche in us that we put our faith in the wrong thing. Because we look at this word that says, if you have enough faith, and so we tend to put faith in faith and not faith in God. So we tend to say, if I have enough faith, then God will accomplish this thing. But we put faith before we put God. But what Jesus is not, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Because Peter's question is this. He's saying, how can something so miraculous happen so quickly? How can this big thing happen in such a small period of time? And look at Jesus' response. He says this in verse 22. And Jesus answered him saying, have faith in, not faith, but God. If you want to see something, the miraculous happen, something big happen in your life, don't have faith in faith, but have faith in God. And if you have faith in God, then you'll see the big things happen. And what is an example of, the, of something big happening? Jesus said in verse 23, and truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, because once again, they're on the mountain of olives, a mountain of olives, and Jesus says, Look at this mountain that we're standing. Whoever says to this mountain, be taken and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes not in the miracle or on faith, but in God and believes that what will happen is going to happen. It will be granted to him. And therefore, I say to you all these things. For which you pray and ask, believe that you have received and they will be granted to you. But this is typically where we stop. Because remember, Jesus is having a conversation, and he does this all in the hearing of his disciples. And what is the problem that is happening here is the issue of hypocrisy. And the issue of hypocrisy has led the children of Israel to live a life that does not produce fruit, even though they purport to produce fruit. They're living in isolation with one another, and they're living a life that does not produce fruit, even though it purports to, to produce fruit. And Jesus is saying, if you want to see that being reversed, you need to have faith in God. But faith in God does not happen in a vacuum. And that's why verse 25 becomes so important. Because Jesus is saying to his disciples, your faith in God is not simply having faith in God to do something big for you. Your faith in God is represented by the fact that you do not live in a vacuum. You cannot claim to love God and hate your brother and have a faith that is authentic. What does a faith in God that produces the miraculous look like? And it looks like this in verse 25. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against one another so that your father in heaven will also forgive you for your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. And if God's not going to forgive your transgressions, God ain't going to do the miraculous for me. If I don't want to see God do the miraculous in my life, I have to stand in front of God with a heart that is willing to live in community with my brother and sister. And how do I live in community with my brother and sister? By bearing my brother and sister's burdens and forgiving one another. 
The, the, the problem with our, 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 our faith has become, is be, our faith has become such an individual endeavor that we've forgotten that every single time Jesus talks about the power of God at move and our relationship with God, it's always a relationship in the context of community. That's how Jesus Christ teaches us how to pray. If you remember, Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. He doesn't say my father in heaven. He says our father who art in heaven. Because Jesus wants his disciples to recognize that we cannot live an authentic faith in isolation because all that is is mysticism. If we're living a faith in isolation that does not involve authentic relationships with other people, we're no better than people who just believe in mysticism and spirituality because our faith cannot manifest itself in a vacuum. And Jesus is saying to his disciples here, look, if you want to see the miraculous happen in your life, if you want to see transformation happen on this kingdom and earth, you need to learn how to live in community. You need to learn how to forgive and to bear each other's burdens. Because if you don't do that, if you don't live in authentic community with one another, then you're, you are not going to see my power at work. Jesus does this miracle and he performs this miracle in the hearing of his disciples. Because once again, he knows that it is these disciples that are going to carry forward the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so they come to Jerusalem in verse 27. And as he's walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. And they began saying to him, by what authority do you have to do these things? Who has given you this authority? Verse 29. And Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question and you answer me. And then I will tell you what authority I do these things. And they began reasoning amongst themselves, saying, well, if we say it is from heaven, he will say, then why do you not believe me? Oh, sorry, I missed verse 30. Verse 30, was John the, ba was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. And so they answer and they say amongst themselves in verse 31, they reasoned amongst themselves, saying, if we say it is from heaven, he will say, then why did you not believe me? But remember, everybody in that point in time was convinced that John was a prophet from God. And so Jesus uh, squeezes these these uh, teachers of the law and the religious uh, elite into having answered this question. And then it's in verse 32, but then if we say it's for men, they were afraid of the people for everyone considered John to having been a real prophet. And answering Jesus, they said, we did not know. So they lied to Jesus, right? Because they don't want to respond to Jesus. And so Jesus says to them, look, if you don't, uh, when, if you say, Jesus says to them, nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus has gone from um, talking to his disciples and, and showing his disciples the importance of um, authenticity, the importance of truthfulness, the importance of community, the importance of forgiveness. And now he's having this interaction with uh, these Pharisees who um, are the exact opposite of what uh, Jesus is trying to teach and to show. These were the religious elite of the, the day. These were the people who purported to produce fruit. Uh, these were the people who wore garments um, uh, physically and metaphorically of righteousness and holiness. Uh, the bright green garments, uh, leaves showing that they were producing fruit, but there was no fruit um, in their hearts with deceitfulness. Um, was jealousy, uh, was they were preparing to murder um, Jesus, and he has nothing for them. He says, if, if you do not want to be truthful, if you do not want to come to terms uh, with your spiritual reality and your condition, um, if, if all you want to do is to be hypocritical, um, then I can't do anything for you. So, my hope and my prayer for, for all of us, once again, is um, that God would give us such a grace to, to recognize, to, to realize, and to not be afraid to, to be truthful uh, about where we're at with, with one another. Um, and that we as a group become gracious with one another um, to continue to build and to encourage and to edify one another in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for your, your word. And um, I, I, I just pray, God, even for my own life, um, where, where I struggle with being truthful, um, 
God, that you will break those walls down, that uh, you will use my brothers and my sisters to, to encourage me, to edify me, to chastise me, where, where I need to correct me, um, where I need to be um, corrected. Because at the end of the day, God, we're going to stand in front of you. Um, and we would all love to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and we cannot do that in a vacuum. So we ask, Father, um, that you continue to mold our hearts together, to knit our hearts together in, in community, that we can be all we can be in Christ Jesus. So I ask and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.